Next question. A five-week-old male is seen in the emergency department for non-bilious emesis. It started last evening and has occurred with every single feed. The size of the emesis correlates to the size of the feed given. Vital signs are unremarkable. Physical examination is notable for a palpable olive-shaped mass in the abdomen and visible peristaltic waves. Cap refill is sluggish at three seconds. A basic metabolic panel is obtained and is notable for a low sodium at 130, a potassium that is also low at 2.6, chloride low at 88, and bicarb 34, which is high. His creatinine is 0.8, which is also high. An abdominal ultrasound is performed and demonstrates a donut sign. What is the next best step in management? A. Obtain hepatobiliary scan. B. Perform a pyloromyotomy. C. Perform endoscopic dilation. Or D. Replete electrolytes and fluids. And the correct answer is D. Replete electrolytes and fluids. This is a good lesson in reading the whole vignette very closely. You likely recognized pyloric stenosis right off the bat. It's easy to get excited and jump right to the definitive management, pyloro pyloromyotomy. However, this child has electrolyte derangements and volume depletion. That requires correction first. The correct answer is to replete electrolytes and fluids prior to any anesthesia administration or surgical procedure. The board's insider quick a tip for this is that quick associations can be very helpful, but they may predispose you to cognitive errors on the test and actually in real life practice. In these two good to be true questions, read all the information provided as there may be a piece of information that changes the right answer. Next question. A newborn infant is having non-bilious emesis on the first day of life. The emesis happens during each and every feed. The newborn additionally has respirations that are associated with bubbling and gurgling. These are associated with episodes of desaturation that resolve with suctioning. The pregnancy and delivery were unremarkable other than the presence of polyhydramnios. Vital signs are unremarkable and weight is appropriate for gestational age. Examination is notable for a normal work of breathing, appropriate bilateral lung sounds, occasional gurgling with respirations, and a soft abdomen with the normal active bowel sounds. The nasogastric tube is placed to decrease emesis and is part of further evaluation. What is a radiographic imaging of the chest and abdomen most likely to show? A, nasogastric tube curled up in mid-chest with distal air present in the bowel. B, nasogastric tube in stomach with multiple air fluid levels in small intestine. C, nasogastric tube in the stomach with two air bubbles in the abdomen and no distal air. Or D, nasogastric tube displaced to the left abdomen and bowel in the left thoracic cavity. And the correct answer is A, nasogastric tube curled up in the mid-chest with distal air present in the bowel. This is a two-step question. First, you must recognize the underlying condition. Second, you must determine what imaging of that condition would look like. The described condition is a tracheoesophageal fistula specifically a blind esophageal pouch, given that, number one, the presence of immediate non-bilious emesis with the feeds and the presence of gurgling with the respirations. Radiographic imaging would show nasogastric tube curled up in the mid-chest with distal air present in the bowel. The presence of bilious emesis, the age of the infant, and imaging, if given, will allow you to determine the underlying cause. Next question. A 13-year-old male is seen in clinic after lacerating his hand on a rusty chain link fence earlier in the day. The wound is cleaned and irrigated. There is no foreign body appreciated. Review of his medical record shows that he received the full DTAP series. His last dose was given at the age of seven years. He is also noted to have a penicillin allergy that is clarified as a rash without anaphylaxis. What is the most appropriate method of tetanus prophylaxis in this patient? A, no prophylaxis is needed. B, tetanus booster plus tetanus Im immunoglobulin. C, tetanus booster plus cephalexin. Or D, tetanus booster alone. And the correct answer is D, 
tetanus booster alone. So this patient has completed a tetanus series. The wound is dirty. It is more than five years since he received his last tetanus immunization, and this patient should receive the tetanus booster alone. Tetanus immunoglobulin would be needed if this patient never completed his series or if his immunization was unknown. No prophylaxis would be needed if the wound was clean. The penicillin allergy and antibiotic choice is a pure distractor. It plays no role in tetanus prophylaxis. Next question. A 16-year-old female is seen in the clinic for a well-child visit. Her medical history is remarkable for occasional vasovagal syncope. She takes no medications. She is sexually active. She has an anaphylactic allergy to eggs. She carries an epinephrine pen that the clinic provides her on an annual basis. Her vital signs are unremarkable. Her examination is unremarkable. Her immunizations are not completely up to date, and she is due for meningococcal, annual influenza, and human papillomavirus immunizations. She has not had any adverse reactions to any immunizations in the past. Which immunization is contraindicated in this patient? A, human papillomavirus, B, inactivated influenza, C, meningococcal, or D, none? And the correct answer is D, none. All right, this question is asking if you understand true contraindications to vaccines. In this scenario, none is the correct answer because none of the aforementioned immunizations are contraindicated in this patient. Previously, there were tighter guidelines on the inactivated influenza vaccination with egg allergies, which is why you may have selected this answer. However, the most recent guidelines from the CDC state that even those with anaphylaxis to eggs can receive the inactivated influenza vaccination if the administering provider can handle a severe reaction. Previous anaphylactic reaction to the influenza vaccination would be an absolute contraindication, and this can actually be applied to any vaccine. So really the, the big contraindication we want to think about for patients that are otherwise not immunocompromised but have a severe anaphylactic reaction to the previous reaction to the previous vaccine, then you would consider that absolute contraindication. Next question. A 15-year-old female is playing in a high school basketball game. Near the end of the first quarter, she takes a charge from an opposing player, falls backwards, and hits the back of her head on the ground. There is no loss of consciousness. The player is wobbly and appears dazed, but is able to make it back to the bench. She is oriented to person, place, and time. Her extraocular eye movements show appropriate tracking. She is able to balance on one leg and squat without issue. The coach and the player want to know if she can return to the game. What is the best recommendation regarding her return to play? A, bench the player for the remainder of the game. B, clear the player to return but limit her playing time. C, clear the player to return immediately without restrictions. Or D, take the player to the closest emergency department for imaging. And the correct answer is A, bench the player for the remainder of the game. Now, this player got her bell rung and sustained a concussion. There has been a large change in the way concussions are approached and treated. The correct response is to bench the player for the remainder of the game. Returning to play on the same day is no longer recommended, as initial deficits may not immediately show up. And adolescents are at very high risk for second impact syndrome, which is a second concussion in temporal association with the first one, which can lead to vascular congestion and cerebral edema. She will very likely need to abstain from any activity for the next 24 to 48 hours to gauge the full extent of her symptoms. Next question. A two-year-old male is brought into the emergency department by emergency medical services after being found unresponsive in his family's pool. His family was having a cookout in their backyard around the pool, and he was found by a family relative. CPR was initiated in the field. He was intubated at the scene. After further stabilization in the emergency department, he is transferred to the pediatric ICU. Which of the following measures would have been most effective in preventing this episode? A, arm and toy flotation devices on the child. B, designated adult serving as lifeguard. C, life jacket on the child plus direct supervision. Or D, limit swimming to areas less than two feet deep. 
I think the correct answer is pretty straightforward for this. It is C, life jacket on the child plus direct supervision. The child sustained a drowning event. The two components of water safety involve devices and supervision. The only answer that incorporates both is the life jacket plus direct supervision. Please note that arm flotation devices and water toys are not a substitute for life jackets and are not considered water safety devices, especially for the purposes of the boards. Next question. A four-year-old female is seen in clinic for a facial rash. It is located on both of her cheeks. Mother reports an oral temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit at home about a week ago. The patient's medical history is notable for sickle cell anemia, for which she takes folic acid and penicillin. Her vaccinations are up to date. Vital signs are unremarkable for fever. Her physical exam is notable only for a confluent erythematous rash over both cheeks. Several blood tests are ordered. Which of the following is most likely to be found on this patient's testing? A, acute anemia with sickling and high reticulocytes. B, acute anemia without hemolysis and low reticulocytes. C, leukocytosis with thrombocytopenia and acute anemia. Or D, leukocytosis with thrombocytosis and normal hemoglobin. And the correct answer is B, acute anemia without hemolysis and low reticulocytes. This is also a two-step question. First, you must recognize that the rash being described is consistent with parvovirus B19, aka fifth disease or slap cheek syndrome. Second, you need to understand what the potential complications of this disease include. Aplastic anemia, which is decreased bone marrow production of red blood cells. This patient is at high risk of aplastic crisis given her underlying sickle cell disease, which has high red blood cell turnover. Her hemoglobin is likely to be low without evidence of hemolysis as this is suppressive, not hemolytic, process. Her labs will show evidence of acute anemia without hemolysis and low reticulocyte count. Next question. An 18-month-old male is seen in the emergency department for decreased oral intake, fever, and rash. Parents state that he is extremely uncomfortable and not drinking anything. His fever has been as high as 102 degrees Fahrenheit orally at home. Several other children at his daycare have similar symptoms. His immunizations are up to date and he has no other medical problems. Vital signs are notable for a fever of 101.8 degrees. Examination is notable for vesicles with an erythematous base located on his palms, soles, and buttocks. There are also vesicular lesions on his soft palate and tonsils. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's illness? A. Coxsackie A virus, B. Herpes simplex virus 1, C. Human herpes virus 6, or D. Varicella zoster virus. And the correct answer is A. Coxsackie A virus. This patient has lesions on his hand, his feet, and his mouth, and his buttocks. This is hand foot mouth disease, which is caused by the Coxsackie A virus. The involved areas are extremely painful, which can lead to decreased oral intake if there's significant oral involvement. The test may try to have you commit to a herpes virus, given the description of the vesicular lesions with an erythematous base. However, this is not a typical presentation of primary varicella, diffuse rash with lesions of different stages, reactivated varicella, non-dermatomal, or herpes simplex because of the lack of herpetic history, such as cold sores, sexual activity, or things like that.